50 meters up. Firefly Aerospace made history back in March 2025. It became the first commercial company to successfully bring a robotic lander to the surface of the moon. Yeah, those those few moments leading up to, to landing were... It, it's really hard to describe kind of how you feel and what's going through your mind. In some sense, everything's going through your mind and also nothing because you're just staring at the screen at these few graphs and data points that you're just waiting to either turn green or sensors to go off and like finally get confirmation. The Blue Ghost Lander was the first fully successful moon landing by a spacecraft since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. An unforgettable moment for those like spacecraft program director Ray Allensworth who were on console that day. I feel like you could hear like everybody take a breath whenever whenever Will came on on ops, you know, over the comms links and said, Alcon, chief engineer on ops. Y'all select the landing. Come around the wheel. You just kind of feel this like huge sense of relief and excitement and you know, we all just started hugging each other. It's you know, I think it's a very special kind of like like 10 minutes of your life that I don't think you'll ever forget. I don't think any of us ever will. Firefly is now in the midst of preparing for its Blue Ghost Mission 2, which represents another giant leap. The payload consists of a lander, which is stacked on a dual payload attach fitting, or DPAF. Beneath that is Firefly's Elytra spacecraft. As it heads towards a landing on the far side of the moon, Firefly will release the lander and DPAF, allowing Elytra to enter into its planned lunar orbit. In May, Firefly announced that Elytra would not only be communicating with the lander, but would also establish the first commercial deployment of high-resolution imaging services from lunar orbit. It's called Ocula. We learned so much on that Blue Ghost 1 mission. For example, you know, when we landed successfully, we got to do the 14 days of lunar surface operations. And from that, we learned things like the temperature differences between the modeling and past data to actual data. And that's kind of where the genesis of this Ocula idea came from. We learned how much we didn't know about the lunar surface. And one of the things I like to share is that um, if you're gonna land humans and you're gonna land more robotic missions to the moon, wouldn't you wanna know everything about the moon's surface, where to land, avoid obstacles and uh, boulders and craters and land safely, but also understand the temperature differences from, you know, the sun bouncing off your vehicle versus a crater behind you and that uh, bouncing back at your vehicle. Just understanding the lunar surface uh, to higher fidelity is one of the reasons why we came up with this Oculus service. Right now, the main tool NASA and its partners have to map the moon and understand its features is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Three, two, one, main engine ignition and liftoff of the Atlas V rocket with LRO Elcross, America's first step in a lasting return to the moon. It launched to the moon along with the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite on June 18th, 2009. And we have indication of spacecraft separation and has been providing data ever since. Kim said the goal for Ocula is to go beyond the capability of the LRO to provide data not only to NASA, but to the Department of Defense and commercial customers. Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we hope, can continue going forward to provide that science data. But we have the opportunity with these commercial missions like Ocula service, where we could even go higher fidelity in terms of our resolution. We're in a special orbit that allows us to sustain over five years of operations around the moon with our Electra orbiter. We also have the ability to use some of the propulsion on board to lower the altitude to image the lunar surface to a higher resolution fidelity than even the reconnaissance orbiter. So there's, there's advantages of this commercial model where we can do things that um, lunar reconnaissance orbiter wasn't designed to do. The LRO has a system of three cameras capable of capturing high-resolution black and white images and moderate-resolution multispectral images. It is two narrow-angle cameras that provide 0.5-meter panachromatic images over a 5-kilometer area and a wide-angle camera that captures images at 100 meter per pixel scale in seven color bands over a 60-kilometer span. As advertised, 
Ocula will be capable of a 0.2 meter resolution of the moon's surface at an altitude of 50 kilometers. Kim says that scale of resolution will help create a better understanding of the landscape for both human and robotic missions. You're also going to be able to, for the lander missions themselves, identify obstacles ahead of time and help find good places to land safely and stably. For the mineral mining missions, commercial missions, having the UV as well as the visible spectrum allows you to find ilmenite, and ilmenite is a good indicator for the presence of helium-3. So, you know, you'll be able to uh, help survey and pick the right locations for the biggest bang for the buck for mining purposes. And then if you want to know what's going on in terms of activity over time on the lunar surface, whether you know, uh, we're putting robotics or humans on the moon, with that kind of resolution, you can start seeing that kind of activity uh, happening as we capture it. The specific operating orbit for this mission is being held close to the vest for now, but Kim said the ultimate goal for the Ocular Service is to offer fast revisit rates for specific sites on the moon, which will eventually require more than one Elytra in orbit around the moon. Between understanding the demand um, and understanding the physics of orbiting and operating around the moon and looking at different geographic futures of the lunar surface and really groundbreaking and uh, opening up new uh, categories with this mission, we're going to be able to formulate what the future constellation is going to look like. Blue Ghost Mission 2 will take a similar lander as the first mission, but will send it to the far side of the moon. Unlike the first mission, though, it's not designed to survive for hours into the lunar night. Quite the opposite. But Mission 2 lander is, is absolutely required to power off um, at the end of that lunar day, and that's by design, uh, because the NASA payload on board, Lucy Knight, um, they require a radio silent environment, and that includes the lander. Um, so really, past that point forward, Lucy will just be using the lander as like, basically a pedestal, and they will be operating on the top deck of the lander for you know a significant period after the lander dies. Kim said the dual mission of the lander and now Ocula will teach them a lot about how to move forward with this technology. The purpose of this first Ocula mission is to provide an affordable means to be a ride share to demonstrate the feasibility of this mission and the capabilities of this mission. We're going to learn a lot from actually performing this mission and we're going to have another opportunity with Blue Ghost 3 as well that will have a tandem orbiter uh, as well. We're just so excited. I mean, the Lunar ecosystem and economy is a huge growth area. It's providing game-changing science as we saw from Blue Ghost 1. There's gonna be multiple more attempts at landing on the moon. Um, and we're just excited about all the infrastructure and the commercial models that are popping up because the moon provides a lot of great benefits in terms of mineral minerals as well as repetitions to operate around cislunar, get ready for Mars exploration as well. And there's the ultimate high ground aspect of it too. So we are really uh, looking forward to what Ocula unlocks for the moon. Reporting for Spaceflight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.